Hey guys, welcome to Inside Music. I'm your host, Richard Allen Smith, and we're gonna to talk to some of the most accomplished people in the music industry today. Come on in, I'll show you. First guest today is a Grammy-winning producer, engineer, and mixer who bases himself right out here in Atlanta, Georgia. His credits include Elton John, Outkast, Lady Gaga, Jewel, Rod Stewart, Josh Stone, Santana, Allison Chains, B.B. King, T.I., Nelly, Third Day, Bruce Hornsby, Ann Wilson. It goes on and on. I don't even have time to read all of his credits. Um, he is a three-time Grammy nominee and won the Album of the Year for his work with Outkast on Speaker Box, The Love Below. I'm referring, of course, to uh, the young man sitting to my left, Matt Still. Matt, welcome. Thanks for having me. So, Matt, I think uh, those of us who've been in the game for a while and in the business, have we've seen it change dramatically. Um, under the old business model, major labels pretty much had a monopoly. They had a monopoly on distribution. They had a monopoly on the talent being signed and really getting it out there into the pipeline. That's all changed. Um, in this new music paradigm, which is a big theme of our show, it, they don't seem as relevant anymore. Everybody's got a direct digital distribution to their audiences. Um, the big recording budgets really aren't there in the way they were in the mm -hmm. days of old. The big production fees, producer's fees aren't there, I would imagine, mm -hmm. in the way yeah. they used to be. How do you find new talent? In other words, how do they end up at Matt Still's doorstep? Well, it's a mix of both that, you know, sometimes I find them and sometimes they find me. Um, I do have my website that people can reach out to me through, but I also do things like look on YouTube, Facebook, um, MySpace, try to find new music that's out there. Um, I listen to a lot of college radio to, mm -hmm. to see what uh, the uh. younger kids are listening to. Um, and through the years, I've, I've made a lot of connections with, with different artists and different managers. And, and people who were in A&R positions before may now have a management company, and they've known me for years, and they may have a young artist that they're trying to get produced that they want to, they want me to bring in, come in on the project, so they'll give me a call and ask me what do I think and yeah. feel like if, uh, see if uh, my style of production would fit that, would fit that artist. The bands that I see the greatest success from are the bands who kind of take their own promotion into their hands. It's a daily thing. Right. Post stuff every every week. Yeah. You know, put up new material for people to see. Put up new songs. In order for you to gain the attention of a label, they, they do look at things like how many followers do you have on mm -hmm. Facebook? How many hits do you have on YouTube? Right. How many people are following you? And they take notice of that stuff. Yeah. So Matt, you touched on a real interesting um, topic just a minute ago, and I want to pursue that a little further, which mm -hmm. is social media. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of new artists that feel like, particularly newer generation, they feel like social media is the be-all, end-all. But it's not a shortcut. It's not a shortcut to, to avoid doing the basic groundwork of marketing, or it doesn't replace uh, publicity, it doesn't replace radio promotion, or really, the most important thing, old school, getting on the road, and touring and establishing that fan base in each of these towns. So what's your take on social media's role? Obviously it's of paramount importance, but... It's a part of the total picture. It's, it's a starting point for artists. It's, it's the easiest way for them to reach out to people and find fans for no cost. Mm -hmm. It's the best place and the easiest place to start. One of your discoveries is a uh, new up and coming artist and her name is Riley. Mm -hmm. What drew you to producing Riley? What did you see in Riley that you thought uh, you'd be a good match for and that you thought this would be a good project to take on? Well, the way I found Riley was through a video that was posted online. Um, there's a guy in town who does a lot of open mics and he posts videos of all the people, who, various people who perform at his open mic. And there was one of Riley and I saw it and she performed her own original song that she wrote she wasn't doing a cover, mm -hmm. and she had an amazing voice, it was a great song, and she could play her own instrument. So it was kind of an easy choice for me yeah. to, to reach out to her. So I reached out to her and her father through Facebook, then we brought her into my studio to do some demos. Mm -hmm. And once we finished that, I put it in front of Elton, and he fell in love with her instantly too, because she's just got so much talent. 
and it's amazing the songs that a, a, a girl of, of this age can write, and now she's grown even more over the past four years that I've known her. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's really been an amazing journey watching yeah. her get to this point. As technology has progressed from the technical side and recording, you know, with things like Pro Tools, moving from tape, to things with the internet where you, have, you can have outreach to millions of people, uh, it has made it easier to make a great recording and it has made it easier to reach out to people. Now this is, this is always a good start. Mm. And technology, as it advances, like you mentioned earlier, has a, has a double-edged sword. You know, there's more content now because it's easier for people to make recordings. People who didn't have access to million dollar studios before mm -hmm. now can have a home recording studio and make an album that sounds just as good, if, if they know what they're doing, just as good as mm -hmm. a studio record. Um, and now with things like Facebook and YouTube, uh, bands can reach out and, and find people, whereas, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you could not reach out to those people. There's no one way to make it in this industry. Yeah. There's no tried and true blueprint anymore. Right. Um, people ask me as, as a producer and engineer, they ask me, oh, well, how did you get to where you, you went? And I said, well, I can tell you exactly everything that I did, and if you go and try to do that, it's not gonna work for you. Yeah. It worked for me. Everybody's gotta find their own path. Right. So you need to reach out to every avenue that's available to you. Yeah. You, you've gotta have a Facebook page. You've gotta have a MySpace page. You've gotta have a YouTube page. You need to tour. You need to go play live. You need to hone your craft. Yeah. You need to get better at your stage performance. Yeah, well that's a whole other segment. Okay, so then yeah. the next thing is gonna be, well how do we tour? We've got product, now how do we, because every band thinks, well I've got a record now, that you, why don't you book me? What's the incentive for them to, to book your band? It's, it's, a, it's a long process. Yeah. Nothing worthwhile is easy and, and quick. Yeah. So you've gotta start small, you've gotta start locally. Yeah. Play, play any gig you can get. I think that's an excellent point. Open up for whatever band you can open up for, right. open up for them. Yeah. Just get your name out yeah, there. Yeah, excellent point. So social media plays a major role in today's new music paradigm, mm -hmm. but it is not the be-all, the be end-all. It's a tool. It's a tool. However, Riley, the artist you discovered mm -hmm. on YouTube, have her perform for us It'd today. be fantastic. She ready? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it.
Riley, really enjoyed your performance. That Thanks. was really terrific. You know what I noticed as a musician <clears throat> is, and this might have been something that attracted you to Riley, I don't know, but your pitch is really like spot on. Thank you. And, <laughs> and we're in an age, you know, where sliced ice, compress, you know, a lot of artists yeah. rely on the technology in the studio and live mm -hmm. to, to get them into pitch. Mm -hmm. But you sounded great. Thank you. The question I think a lot of uh, aspiring artists want to know is how did you break through? How did you how did you connect to Matt? We talked a little yeah. bit about that earlier, but they want to know, you know, everybody wants to know what's the secret, what's the mm -hmm. what's the trick? Yeah, I would say I was kind of trying to figure it out. Um, I just started doing open mics and um, going out and performing my stuff, and and I guess eventually started putting stuff on YouTube, which is how Matt found me in the first place. Yeah, so I yeah, guess we talked about YouTube that. is like a huge thing. So All as right. long as you get yourself out there. Okay. So Matt, how did you stumble? Oh, did you stumble? I mean, or did somebody say, "Hey, check this out. This is like well, this is actually, real talented. my wife." Found uh, it uh, uh, first. She had gone to one of the open mics and yeah. knew that th this guy put up uh, videos of the performances. And she saw Riley first because she was looking for her friend. Right. She saw Riley. And said, "I think you should check this girl out." Yeah. And so I saw the video and I was like, "Yeah, you're right." And I then do. what was the process after you like like Wow, she's really talented. Then did you reach out to her? Did you? I reached out to her and her father through Facebook. I just started. I found her name and I just started you know googling and going on Facebook and trying to figure out where I could find her. Yeah. And I friended her and Frank on yeah. Facebook and said, "This is who I am, okay. and love to come and see you." And after I saw her, we decided to go into the studio to uh, to cut a demo. As the demos kind of moved on. Yeah. With each day, I kind of I got more excited about it, and I knew the fact yeah. that because I kept getting more and more excited, I, and I knew there was something there. Right. So, at what point did you say, "Okay, I'm going to take this"? Because uh, you have a relationship with Elton, because you've mm -hmm. done a lot of work with him. You said, "I'm going to take this to Elton." Uh, two or three songs, four songs. How many? How many songs you put together to take? We had to three him? songs. And, and how did that happen? Uh, we had three songs, and did you I, call him up and say, "Hey, Elton, it's Matt"? Yeah. Well, I knew he was going to be in town. We were going to have <laughs> lunch one day, and yeah. so I kind of had a, a, a date. Yeah. On the calendar marked that, okay, I know this is coming up. Yeah. And I had Riley go do a photo shoot so we could have some professional photos done. And yeah. I put together a, a CD for him with some, some photos and kind of some liner notes and all that kind of stuff myself. Mm -hmm. And went and had lunch with him and I played him the CD and he fell in love with it immediately. Yeah. At the end of the first song, he went back and listened to it again. Okay. And then he listened to it again. And was, that, knew, it was that, did that seal the deal right then and there, or did it oh, happen? Oh yeah, that, uh, that was, that was he, in, in his mind, that yeah. had sealed the deal right there. And okay. he, was, he was so enthusiastic about it, he asked me to get Riley on the phone yeah. so he could talk to her. And <laughs> this was the middle of the school day, and so I texted her, I said, call me as soon as you can, yeah. someone needs to talk to you. Yeah. She goes, I'm at, I'm at lunch, so call me, and I call her, and said, hey, Someone wants to talk to you, and I handed out on the phone. And wow, that's. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> My friends so, are like, "Who are you talking yeah. to?" Oh, it's just Elton John. I'll, Elton I'll be John. with you. Soon. They're like, "No, it's not. Why are you like?" What? <laughs> right. Why are you fronting? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Riley has been doing a lot, a lot of songwriting. She's put yeah. in an incredible amount of work to get where she has yeah. today. Uh, her song catalog is is huge now. I think it's over two hundred songs now. Yeah, about. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so, Riley, you're leaving us today to go out to LA Sunday. to do yeah, some writing. For and like then you go to weeks. New York to write, yes. is that right? Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so she's she's really putting in a lot of hard work yeah. uh, to and, and it's gonna pay off. Yeah. It's gonna pay off. Yeah. My next guest is the owner of Tree Sound Studios. The list of clients who have recorded there starts with Aerosmith and ends with Usher. In between are literally hundreds of rock, rap, folk, and R&B acts who've sought out this Atlanta facility's blend of state-of-the-art recording technology and environmentally conscious outlook. I'm describing the young man to my left, Paul Diaz. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, let's start out with a question, because we know that the, the industry has changed. That's the whole focal point of our, of our show. And how has that affected you, or has it? Uh, how have you weathered that storm dealing with smaller budgets? I, I think the, the easiest answer to that is to diversify, really. What we've done is we've moved from just being a recording studio 
to you know doing. We have a hip hop blog called Three Little Digs. We've got a film company that shoots videos for artists and does stuff for the blog. We've got uh, Tree Leaf Music, which is our indie label slash publishing, mm -hmm. discovering you know younger artists, discovering new bands, bringing them in at independent artist rates, basically to mm -hmm. be able to fill time that otherwise would be empty. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Tree Leaf Music because mm -hmm. you just uh, pointed out that uh, that you had the label. Who are some of the artists on, on the Tree Leaf Music label, and what's your fo do you focus on anything genre specific? No. And beyond recording yeah. those artists, what strategies are you employing to get them out there into the to the marketplace? Well, I th uh, it's a pretty you know it's not genre specific. We're doing some hip hop, we're doing some folk music, we're doing some bluegrass, mm -hmm. we're doing some blues, we're doing uh, singer songwriters. So it's kind of the, I yeah. think the focus of the label is songs. Right, just good. good We're music. really looking for writing. We're looking for yeah. great songs, yeah. and then it doesn't really matter to me what genre it is. Okay, as long as the song is there. Yeah. Uh, you're, you've got your record label, so you're doing independent record production. Yeah. For other artists out there who are recording an independent music project, what's uh, the biggest piece of advice that you can uh, give them in terms of increasing their chances to get their project out there? You have any insights on that? I, yeah, I think you know social media is obviously a big one. Okay. You know, have it on iTunes. Have it, you know, get one of the somebody like Orchard, who's an aggregator, who takes your your digital song and puts it on iTunes and Spotify and just Rhapsody and sends it to all the. Okay, now hold it, hold it right there yeah. because Spotify now is the big controversy about that's happening with the number of plays. Spotify versus the remuneration, and there's a big controversy about whether artists should even allow their material on Spotify. What, are well, you, what do you, you know, think about that? Publicity is publicity. Okay, is kind of how I feel about it. Um, and and especially in the world that we're in now, people give away music so yeah. much, right? Because they have to get it out there. It has to be you know heard. Otherwise, yeah. it doesn't matter. And a very typical scenario is. You're giving it away right. to any any and everybody. So don't look at the, so don't look at the CD as so much of a profit center any longer, but as a calling card kind for of. the live performance yeah. and building your yeah. And, your and, and and then the live performance is obviously a huge part of it because you have to have a following. Yeah. You know, you can be on YouTube, you can be on Facebook, but unless you're active in front of a group of humans performing, yeah. then you're not gonna. Not only you're not gonna get better at performing, right? But you're not gonna have a fan base that that can relate to you that much easier, right? Um, it's still, it's in, in a lot of ways, it's still the same as it ever was. Yeah. You're opening for some band that's bigger than yours. Yeah. You're opening for an artist that's got a following, or you're pooling together a group of artists to try and get a bigger show. It's amazing how it's almost gone back to old school, which is getting on the road, and the, and the right. emphasis on the live performance. Right, and that's where the money is, too, for yeah. a lot of artists. Yeah. Uh, a lot of these artists who are not making CD sales are selling tickets to shows. Right. And ticket sales and merch are, are the and two merch, biggest exactly. revenue generators. Exactly. T-shirts yeah. and, and yeah. tickets, right. Yeah. Man, all great stuff. Thank you so much for being on the sure. show today. Really appreciate all right your on. insights and uh, continued success. If you want to reach Paul and, and talk to him about uh, coming on board as an engineer or submitting your material, give the information yep. one more time. Paul at treesoundstudios.com. There you have yeah. it. Thanks. All right, man. Well, that's our show for today, guys. We'd like to thank you for joining us on Inside Music. We hope you'll join us again next time. We're going to explore the entire world of music publishing. A couple people to thank Sound Lab Music Studios, Octagon Studios of Atlanta for making this possible. We'll see you next time.